will have a critical mass that will impact also uh, the electricity grid. So in the future, we need also to consider that EV and renewable uh, electricity development will get more and more connected as the technology of vehicle to grid or V2G is being developed. We will have three uh, excellent panelists. The first one will be uh, Dr. Indra Chandra Setiawan. He is a project general manager of Toyota Daihatsu Engineering Manufacturing Thailand. He will talk about the development of electric vehicles in Indonesia or in uh, Southeast Asia, especially from the perspective of EV battery supply chain and development. The second panelist will be Ms. Minta Powatanawong. She is an engineer, professional level at the Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, DD, Ministry of Energy of Thailand. Ms. Powatanawong or Ms. Minta will talk about both issues of electric storage system, renewable and EV in Thailand. And uh, the third panelist will be Mr. Sif Agarwal. He is sales leader Asia Pacific region of GE Renewable Energy Hybrids. He will talk about the development of battery storage to support renewable electricity, especially from solar and wind activities, strategies, and plan of G Renewable in Asia. So uh, let, uh, we will have the first panelist, Dr. Indra Chandra Stiawan, who has worked in the automotive sector more for more than 20 years now. He is currently the project general manager of Toyota Daihatsu Engineering Manufacturing Thailand in charge for zero emission vehicle strategy and technical research for Asia region. He has a key role in formulating Toyota strategy toward carbon neutrality in the region through the development of zero emission vehicle, both battery electric vehicle and fuel cell electric vehicle. As part of leading research team, Dr. Indra has worked hard to drive a sustainable automotive policy together with Indonesian government stakeholders. He, he, he is also a member of IATO, Society of Automotive Engineer, and actively participate in many activities for promoting automotive technology and industry development. And he is Indonesian nationals and actually resides in Bangkok uh, with his family. When he isn't spending time with his family or promoting carbon neutrality via multiple pathways approach, he is a terrific uh, golfer. So Dr. Indra, the screen and floor is yours. Uh, here today and uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, things already mentioned by Dr. Joko to start our uh, discussion today so let me share my screen first so today uh, as uh, uh, requested by area so I would like to touch upon the accelerating uh, electric vehicles, especially in Indonesia and also Southeast Asia. And uh, before going too deep into the, uh, the topics, but first uh, I would like to share our commitment as a company. Uh, actually, Toyota in 2015, uh, we issued our Toyota Environmental Challenge that we are aiming to challenge six things uh, up to 2050. But in last year, in 2021, we are recommitted our carbon neutrality uh, with more holistic and realistic, and uh, considering all XED vehicles, uh, clean energy suppliers, and also factory emission. So you can see in the right uh, graph that this is the target that we are aiming right now for the, to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. So part of our challenges, we also committed uh, uh, ourselves that we are going to expand more and more zero emission vehicles, not only fuel cells, but also battery electric vehicles. This is the quantitative target that uh, the company was uh, determined to achieve, uh, which announced last year, to achieve 3.5 PEVs uh, from uh, 10 million that we are currently selling a year. And uh, this is on top of that and uh, there are uh, 3.5 million uh, and 1 million including Lexus uh, all in the, or North America, Europe and China. But uh, despite the global, uh, we also need to put our, uh, our, our practicality, especially uh, looking to our uh, challenges or enablers in, in Southeast Asia or Asia. 
So as a, uh, as a regional head office, we are here in Bangkok. We are uh, uh, determining our uh, stance. Uh, so we are aiming the practical and sustainable carbon neutrality uh, by uh, doing uh, more spectacular and accessible electrification, appropriate life cycle action, and also the most important is we need to align with the country's national interests and sustainable development goals through the most suitable pathways. So we don't think the only, there is still a little bullet in here and uh, we need to uh, really embrace the suitable pathways toward each country or national interest. And uh, not only from the uh, air tailpipe emission, but we also need to tackle from the overall uh, life cycle uh, emission as well. So by uh, committing to our stance, then what will be our practical strategy? You can see in XCP technology, we have uh, what we call hybrid electric vehicle, which is the rational is uh, this is, we don't need a vehicle change and nor required another infrastructure. And uh, currently is the most affordable uh, XEV. And we, by doing so, that we can build mass uh, of uh, XEV uh, penetration to the market. And also we provide a plug-in hybrid electric vehicles where we can also uh, utilize this vehicle as a customer second car or potential private charging and also can have a premium price, can cover high battery costs. And for the EV, uh, even though uh, the technology is improving, we believe that uh, we still uh, you, we have some enablers that we need to really put into the market and then we can also utilize the maximum impact towards the utilization of the EV. And also, so for fuel cells, now we are working very hard with the country's uh, uh, governments, especially in Thailand, Malaysia, where they have a uh, uh, high intention to promote uh, uh, green hydrogen as part of their uh, multiple pathway approach. And for us, uh, for electrification, uh, we need to see from the three lenses. As you can see as the screen, as a Toyota, uh, whatever we, we talk about electrification, we would like to see is in, uh, using three, these three lenses. First, uh, electrification meaning is not only in uh, tailpipe emission, but we also need to reduce the whole life cycle emission as well. And the last and, and the second is about the, how we're going to manage economic impact. In some countries, there are a policy to support uh, through the subsidy or incentive, but maybe uh, this uh, kind of approach cannot be easily uh, implemented to another country as well. And the last part, it will be the customer acceptance. Without the customer acceptance, then it's very much difficult to really, uh, you know, take off as I mentioned by Dr. Joko earlier. So our stance and direction of electrification and carbon neutrality should be in line with the government direction and also target of each country. So let's see uh, one by one what we are, uh, the meaning of these three lenses for us. And I think for the, uh, all of us as well. First about uh, reducing life cycle emission. Uh, despite uh, zero tailpipe emission, uh, it, we know that it's very challenging or it's very quite uh, uh, difficult to achieve carbon neutrality under life cycle without changing power generation. That's why I think the intertwined uh, topics as mentioned by Dr. Joko is uh, rightly on, on place. We need to also discuss uh, changing how we're going to change our power generation mix and to the more renewable and also carbon neutral fuel availability as well. So this is as an OEM, uh, Toyota committed we not only taking care of the vehicle life cycle in terms of usage, but also we need to start from uh, the beginning, it's mean from the upstream where we start the R&D, we do also, we make the manufacturing process and involving the supply chains. And at, and at the later stage, we also need to manage the vehicle life cycle. And the last important piece of this uh, puzzle is will be the recycling itself. So uh, we then, uh, we need to see it, this as a more holistic approach rather than just see it only the uh, emission uh, as a tailpipe emission only. And the second pillar is related to the managing economic impacts. 
we need to ensure all the parties or the value chains of key stakeholders is work uh, in the harmonious basis. So otherwise, we cannot uh, uh, achieve the, uh, the business model, which is uh, can allow us to transit to carbon neutrality and not the causing the, the bigger impact to economy and society itself. So just uh, put in the BEV perspective, so uh, based on, uh, I think battery later on, uh, uh, next panelists will discuss about the battery. Uh, we understand that the local battery maybe uh, is not so make, uh, quite different uh, in terms of the price or the cost. And for the Southeast Asia or Asian market, so if we consider the battery price, it's, it's now more challenging uh, in terms of uh, uh, upfront cost. Because if you compare, for example, in the left side, this is what happened in US, the increase of the maybe entry level ICE compared to BEV is only around maybe 17.3%. But once you compare uh, this battery electric vehicle to the ICE in the developing countries, so the, the, the scale has become uh, quite obvious. So it will be increased the price up to the 38.1%. Uh, so difficult for manufacturers to sustainably sell the EV uh, with a competitive price in the developed market. So this is the main challenges. And uh, this is the, the data that I took from my research team. Uh, we uh, uh, gathered the statistical data this is the market of XEV cells in Indonesia. Uh, up to last June, you can see in the left side, uh, uh, only, how to say, uh, the XEV market share is still a 0.5%, which is the BEV is a, a consists of 0.2%, uh, hybrid is a 0.2%, and the zero uh, plug-in hybrid. You can see that the, the combination of the limited incentive and the subsidized fuels, with, uh, which is available in Indonesia, and also the high price of the vehicle itself, it, it currently it makes the bank penetration is, is quite difficult. And then, uh, and we think that this is still in an early adapter phase. So let's also see what happened in uh, uh, Thailand. The uh, Thai government uh, is uh, very kind to provide the subsidy, cash subsidy, uh, other. Uh, not only passively actually, so they also provide like the import duty reduction from 8% to 2% and also import duty for the people, uh, to the automaker who can produce in Thailand. You can see that once the, this policy put in place, uh, the, the, the significant sales increase uh, it significantly, uh, you can see in this uh, uh, center table that uh, from previous months, uh, January to April, there are only uh, one, around 1,300 vehicles sold. But once the policy put in place, it's up to uh, 10,000 uh, BEV cell. So we can see that the BEV market a lot also together with the high fuel price is also play a significant uh, yeah, maybe factor to uh, increase the adoption. And the last part of our lenses is related to the customer acceptance. So we did some research, actually we did three research uh, from 2020, 21, and 22. And so we tried to find out what is the reason to buy for the customer. But this research uh, scope only in around Bangkok area. So for the recent A, we can found that the value for money, so vehicle price with subsidy is motivating people to buy electric vehicles. And also the current oil price, which is not uh, subsidized in Thailand for the gasoline. And in the research B, we, we know that uh, there is also some consideration related to charge itself. But of course, the second point also related to vehicle price and oil price. And uh, the last research we did that uh, low cost is uh, their consideration and also some advanced technology. So you can see there are some intertwined factors here and the uh, price and also high fuel price is also one of key drivers in time of uh, BEP adoption. But at the same research, we also try to find what is the reason why people rejected the BEV. You can see that in the research B, we have a chance to ask them. And uh, for the people who never experienced EV, they are more concerned in lack of charging station, and they're considered about the price because it's too expensive for them. And also, we are considered about how about my uh, repair. So they need to also consider a specialist garage which handle EV. 
and the last part is recharging time. But it's quite similar when we found uh, in the research C. But the actual data, when we try to get, uh, get the data from the BV users, and they are not really concerned about uh, the charging station because most of them, 87% or 88%, is quite similar number from these two research. They they able to do all their drive needs is by using only the home charging. So this is one of a finding that we found why is quite different uh, from the people who already use BEP and people not uh, uh, using BEP yet. And the last uh, of my presentation, so the goal is not only just a single technology, there are multiple pathways that we can uh, pursue uh, in parallel toward the neutrality. And our concept is uh, leaving no one behind that, that no stakeholder can accomplish it alone. So we provide the technology, then we also need to embrace the cross collaboration. And the country, as uh, I mentioned in the beginning, we are all will align our policy, our strategy to what the country needs, and we need to do it in long term. Uh, otherwise, it will be very difficult to do this transition. Thanks, that's all I can uh, share to you all of this. Thank you very much, Dr. Joko. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Indra, for the very uh, interesting presentation. And we see that uh, there are several aspects have been summarized from several research that uh, that becomes customers' uh, reason of why they choose and why they don't choose uh, EV. I think by handling those those uh, points, we can reach uh, some tipping points of EV uh, penetration uh, in the market. But We'll get back to that later. Now I would like to uh, introduce also uh, the second speaker, Ms. Minta Puatanavong, who is an engineer, professional level at the Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, DED, Ministry of Energy of Thailand. She received a Bachelor Degree of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering with honors from the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom and a Master of Science in Renewable Energy, Enterprise, and Management from Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. She joined the EDE Divisions of Human Resource Development after graduation, where she developed and oversaw the implementation of energy efficiency training courses. She currently works at the Division of Energy Efficiency Promotion, where her primary responsibilities include developing and implementing energy efficiency policies in the transportation sector, with one of the key measures being a financial incentive program that provide, provides subsidies to energy efficiency measures for freight transportation. Please, uh, Ms. Minta, yeah, the screen and floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Joe Ko, for the um, introduction. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My, um, first of all, I would like to say a deeply appreciation and thank you to the Ministry of Mine and Energy of Cambodia, along with Economic Research Institutes for ASEAN and East Asia and Energy Research Institute Network. Again, my name is Minta Puwatanawong. I work for Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, Ministry of Energy, Thailand. My work is mainly based on promoting EVs in Thailand. But today I'll be talking about the policies for the batteries and EV, maybe a bit um, wider than batteries as a ESS. Today, the world has focused on the impact of climate change through corporations together at the international levels to maintain the global temperature rise, the 26 climate change COP26 at the Glasgow in the late 2031, as well as the international communities continue to increase the concentrations of goals, both in terms of energy and environmental greatly in order to focus on the production and the use of energy that is net zero emission in the long term. As present, every country in the world has a need to accelerate the reform of energy structure as well as increase the proportion of clean energy usage in the energy sectors, whether at the network level or grid scale. And at the consumer level, also the reduction of fossil fuel shoes in use in transport sectors with the transition to use 
as an electric vehicle. However, due to the high proportion of clean energy in the form of renewable energy, along with the number of electric vehicles, there are likely to increase would affect to both the stability of power grid system. It also makes the nature of electricity demand change so much that electricity administrator, like for our Thailand, ECAD will have the expense preparation to deal with voluntary and uncertainties of a variety of renewable energy source. This issue has become a factor that drives the power systems in the future to be developed to be more efficient, inevitable, and more flexible. Although finding flexible energy resources are different from what it is now, now that we need to focus on the demand side through the support of decentralized energy stores, distributing energy resources that join the power grid systems, Energy storage systems can be regarded as an energy source decentralized form that can enhance the stability and flexibilities of the electricity network efficiency, efficiently. Electricity can be stored for a period of time to meet demands. It can also work with other systems to help improve energy management in both energy supply and energy demands at the same time. Therefore, it is clear that energy storage is a technology that play an important role in the transition era. In main times, the stabilization of the power system promotes the production of renewable energy source, which will significantly reduce the carbon dioxide in the electric power industry. In addition, energy storage systems play an important role in both microgrids and prosumer systems and electrical vehicle EV, which will definitely be more demanding in the future. In Thailand, there are few battery manufacturers or lithium ion since its high energy density, high specific energy, and a long cycle efficiency. It can be seen that lithium ion is suitable to be used in EV due to its outstanding features in terms of both lightweight and small size, and other types also have a very low energy loss compared to others. Therefore, it is one of the best choice to use in general to support the demands in the power grid systems. To support the battery and EV industry in Thailand, apart from what Dr. Um, the previous panelist has mentioned the incentives that the user will get, I will be talking about a few financial investments promotion incentive for manufacturers. The Board of Investments of Thailand provides the tax and financial incentive that exempt or reduce on the corporate income tax for three to eight years. The exemption of import duty on machinery, exemption of import duties on raw material that used in the manufacture or exports, also in the research and development purpose, as well as advanced technology training grants. And for the non-tax incentive, we have 100% foreign ownership, land ownership rights, work permits, and visa felicitate facilitations and no restriction for foreign currency. The BOI promotions package for electrical vehicle include three and four wheelers, the motorcycle, bus, truck, boat, also as the charging stations and the EV parts and components. For example, building or repair electric ships normally get eight years corporate income tax exemption. The support for battery includes cell production models, productions, and pack assembly. And also we do give incentive for battery charging station as well. So basically we try to cover all aspects to drive the EV market forward. As I mentioned, this is for the incentive for manufacturer. As well, we also have an incentive for buyer to persuade and pushing the EVs forward. For the legal and standards, we follow the UNR hundreds for the four wheelers and UNR 136 for the motorcycle. This includes vibration tests, thermal shocks and cycling, mechanical shocks, mechanical integrations, fire resistance, external short circuits protection, overcharge protections, over discharge protection, and over temperature protections. This is kind of a promising for user. Many users have belief that EV might be more dangerous than ICE, than ICE internal combustion engine. That's why they still 
deciding whether to change to EV or not. So this kind of standards will show them that it is safe for them to use EV and persuade them to, to buy EV. Also, apart from the UN regulations, we, they all, the manufacturer need to pass for the um, Department of Land Transport standards and the um, Thailand Institute standards for to be sell in Thailand. To maximize the use of RE to power EV, the key is the battery. Thailand aim to increase the share of RE in the total country energy consumption each year to be carbon neutral by 2050 and to be net zero emission by 2065. RE will play a large part in the share. We are currently revising our national energy plan, which is mentioned earlier by Dr. Puntat. Lastly, the amount of RE will be more than 50%. This is forecast that the cost of RE will be cheaper as well as the cost of energy storage system batteries and the lockings of smart grid. So I would like to remind again our 4D and 1E as mentioned earlier by Dr. Poonpat. Digitalization, decarbonization, decentralization, deregulation, and electrification. This is the five things that we consider doing and practicing in our writing our new national energy plan policy. Thank you, Dr. Joko. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Minta. I guess uh, we have uh, had this very comprehensive presentation from Ms. Minta about the readiness of uh, Thailand government in in the issue of uh, penetration of EV as well as the penetration of renewable, uh, all in the same slides, and it was very uh, educative and interesting. Now I let's move on to the third uh, panelist, Mr. Sif Agarwal. Uh, Mr. Sif is a renewable energy professional with more than a decade experience on solar storage and hybrid system in Asia Pacific region. He has studied management course from University of California at in Los Angeles, a master degree in renewable energy from IET Delhi, and bachelor degree in electrical engineering. SIF uh, focus to develop mar market, sell, and implement go-to-market strategies related to solar, battery, storage, and hybrid systems in Asia Pacific region. That includes opt optimized contract structuring, technology advocacy, vendor financing, importance of partner reliability in longer term to assist developers, IBPs to unlock value for their projects. Uh, Mr. Sif has hands of experience to develop, design, build, and operate uh, MW scale of uh, yeah, megawatt scale renewable energy power plants to achieve optimum energy yields and minimizing uh, LCOE. He is well versed in resource assessment, including site evaluation, preparation of feasibility studies, and other development activities in project life cycle. So please. Uh, Mr. Sif, the screen and floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Zopo. Okay. So I hope everybody can see my screen. First of all, thank you for all the organization, organizers to invite GE to present the hybrid solutions, as well as uh, honored to be the panelist here. So today I'm going to talk about the hybrid systems and uh, basically why they are important and uh, how we can benefit basically combining several renewable energy technologies together with stories and it really helps to, let's say, go in the right direction where we could start replacing the conventional power generation sources. Okay. So these are some powerful trends which we are seeing, I think, uh, from earlier two presenters. Basically, decarbonization is one of the main theme which is driving renewable power addition into the grids, and we, it will continue to do so. And digital, digitalization is one of the important trend which we are noticing where we have information and we can make real-time decisions 
and decentralization is of course uh, automatically happening and it will be more and more uh, basically you will have more and more generation close closer to the consumption and uh, unlike the conventional power plants where basically you had power plants somewhere remotely located and power is transmitted through grid infrastructure to the loads the fourth one is electrification so electrification is actually the one of the example could be the evs basically we will see more and more electricity to be utilized in in uh, in coming years and we will need more and more electricity as compared to what we need today these are some macro data based upon uh, basically pre prepared by bloomberg new energy finance you can see the new capacities addition into the total install mix will be more very high percentage come from solar and wind probably there will be some gas as well but i think uh, the majority will come from solar and wind because lcoe for both of the uh, technologies continue to go down and this really helps to bring down the overall lcoe and the energy in the mix Uh, however, with the increased renewable penetration into the grids, we have some challenges. We have challenges of dispatchability, grid stability, and basically some time affordability. But I think LCO, the way LCOEs are going down, affordability will not be a that big concern, but dispatchability, grid stability will be the leading concerns. And so we have hybrid system which can provide some solutions for the, those kind of problems. When we talk about a hybrid system, we are mainly talking about combining two or more technologies, which could be, let's say, integrating a solar and storage system. And by doing that, we could increase the dispatchability. Basically, if you see on the graph, uh, number one, where basically renewable power is getting curtailed because the load is low. So you could charge the batteries at that time and you can deliver the power where number two is there where the peak demand or peak load is up in the grid. And at the same time, the batteries are very, very flexible source of uh, generation, let's say the delivering the power to the grid. So it can also manage the frequency to the grid in the small, small disturbances. And it can also act as a spinning reserve where you have to uh, run the, you know, other kind of generation sources which are running freely for just to provide the spinning reserve and stability to the system. So actually adding battery energy storage can really help to bridge all those requirements from combining to a solar or wind power plant. Second example would be integrating solar and wind together. And what it does, wind normally we see the wind is generally more in the night times and less in the day times. And while solar is uh, opposite, we have all the solar in the daytime. So if you combine two technologies, you can take advantage of, uh, you know, increase capacity factors, basically optimize the electrical balance of plant systems and interconnection capacities and optimize use of land. Of course, it brings down the LCOE combining two technologies together. G as a company, we, it has a lot of, uh, uh, let's say the platforms already available because G, G work quite intensively in value analysis, control system, digital services, and grid management. And G also has the wind, wind turbines, hydro systems, solar energy available, solar energy plants. And as well as we also have some storage systems, which is pump hydro storage, as well as battery energy storage we have as of today. Hybrid system design process, I would say it's very unique to each site. So each site in, in it itself is quite unique how you optimize a hybrid system. Just to give an example, basically, if you want to combine a wind and solar site, first you collect all the data from the site and you try to do a resource assessment of both the sources. And then basically a value analysis should be done based upon correlation and curtailment analysis. And based upon that, economic evaluation will be done 
both on CAPEX and OPEX of the system. And finally, as an outcome, you receive a hybrid system, which is a combination of either wind solar or wind solar battery or solar battery. It could be any combination. Now, once you have designed the hybrid system, you have installed the hybrid system, you also need very, very flexible and real-time based control systems, which I would just focus on dispatcher today. Uh, basically, are you able to deliver that power in the manner where how the grid is required, this power? You know, you suddenly you have a demand from the grid, both for active and reactive power. Are you able to deliver that, basically? So you you the the plant control the conventional methods where uh, rule based uh, plant controls will not work in this dynamic scenario because the, the the things are very dynamic it changing the generation is changing you can't control the solar and wind you can't control the demand from the grid side basically what you can control how you deliver the power so you really need to adjust these things in the real time so it, to, to bridge that gap, basically, uh, the kind of uh, real-time algorithm-based dispatcher devices come into the place where you can deliver power from these uh, resources based upon their generation profile and what grid is required, you could deliver the power as per the, you can bridge the gap with these uh, dispatcher devices. Two case studies I would like to show. So this is one of the case study where basically wind, solar, and battery was combined for a customer in India. Uh, you could see there were certain challenges. We, the customer required to meet a load profile. He had a limited interconnect capacity of 25 megawatt, and he was really looking forward to optimize the system. So we did analysis, the same analysis, uh, basically curtailment, correlation analysis, and we designed a system for him which could deliver all his requirements and we could combine all the three technologies, which provided him an increased capacity factor because once you install wind, solar and battery together, your capacity factor could be as high as 50% for a particular location. So essentially, if you are a 25 megawatt plant at a 50% capacity factor, probably it is, it is towards a, it's the right step towards your meeting the demand as you will get from a conventional power plant. Second is very unique. So, which is basically uh, reducing, directly reducing the carbon emissions. So we combine the battery and a gas turbine, where basically battery is providing the ramp up, ramp down services. So and the gas turbine don't really don't need to run, you know, in the times when it, it doesn't really need to run. So you are not burning any fuel. And if there is a sudden demand, basically battery can come in and it can provide the necessary ramp up, ramp down, or feed the load in those short durations and can really help the uh, system and reduce the carbon footprint of the overall installation. This was an innovation of the year in 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sif. So uh, now uh, I would like to ask uh, several questions to the three panelists. And also uh, later on, maybe from the floor, we will have uh, questions. For uh, Dr. Indra first. So uh, yeah, go back to the uh, customer acceptance uh, issue that uh, becomes uh, a key component for the uh, electric vehicle adoption. And we have seen that there were uh, significant difference between in, in the acceptance between customer that that uh, that have been using EV and uh, versus those who haven't using uh, haven't been using EV so what kind of uh, policy makers role uh, in explaining to the customers or like end users uh, yeah in relation to the a lot of myths or, or, or a wrong perception for example uh, the limited uh, uh, driving distance or the infrastructure because uh, sometimes we, we, we see uh, EV and charging kind of a uh, uh, chicken and egg problem. If you don't have a charger, I don't want to buy EV. If, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, if, if, if government would like to build charger, but there is no EV, 
So, yeah, please uh, comment on this. Thank you, Pak Indra. Thank you, Dr. Joko. So, based on our research, that this knowledge gap is really, you know, wider uh, uh, depending on the the target customer that we are interview or do some uh, deeply research. So one is the reason is uh, because without the experience, I think EV is, is, is part of the how you experiencing things. Once you, you, you experience that and you feel there is, uh, you know, that the EV can be part of your daily life, then your, your, your view towards that technology will be changed. And uh, that's why, uh, based on this uh, research, we also try to, uh, how to say, formulate what is the best strategy uh, to really engage uh, the common people, the people that not uh, have any experience before, to really uh, able to make them experiencing. And I think one a good example what we had in Thailand is there is a PTT they have a, a how to say a subsidiary company who can uh, provide the short term lease uh, for people who experience to able to experiencing the EV. Uh, if you are a Thai citizen, you have driving license, you can rental this EV for 24 hours or even three days, one week, a month before you deciding to really use that kind of uh, uh, electric vehicle. We think this kind of approach need to be, you know, expand not only in Thailand, but other countries as well. And I think the other factor is maybe we can use a big data. So uh, if we can collaborate with uh, maybe platformers that people who already try EV, they can share their experience and make like advocacy towards the uh, their their daily uh, uh, how to say interaction with the technology, and and I have a hypothesis also related to a charger. For example, uh, when we're talking about chargers, especially the infrastructure that need to build outside our home, then then the government thing or even the charging company would like to provide the fast charger or even ultra fast charger. They need to provide what fifty kilowatt maybe 100 kilowatt or 150 and so on. But the price of those charger is quite expensive. So in my research that one uh, AC charger level two, for example, uh, is maybe with one DC charger, we can install 100 uh, of AC level two charger. So we need to change the behavior of charging. So means it doesn't mean you need to for example, we, you, if you only have one DC charging and two outlets, and even though you charge 30 minutes at the minimum, everyone else needs to wait. But if you have a hundred charge points with the same cost, then everyone who will need to access those charging, even though it's slow charging, they don't need to wait. So at least they can uh, also continue their journey with that kind of uh, electricity charge already in their vehicle. So because the research show 87 or 88 percent people charge at home. So that's that's the the, the the real situation right now in Asia. Well I think the same data you can be you can find also in Europe, US or other cases. So it's, it doesn't mean I think infrastructure is one thing, but uh, the most important is how about the affordability at this point and it didn't really kick in this uh, EV. That's uh, my update on this one. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Indra. So, uh, in fact, uh, EV is kind of a significant change in, in lifestyle, in daily life. Yes. And I guess what you have mentioned, like the leasing of, of, of uh, short-term leasing of EV can be kind of uh, yeah, uh, learning by experience for, for, yes. for the potential users. And one thing that you have mentioned, which is, really important in my opinion is the yeah, charging mechanism. I mean, not only uh, because charging can be attraction for EV, but also like we need to see how the, the, the pattern of charging can be also uh, yeah. giving impact to the grid system and the, uh, yeah, in the uh, also at the end to the emissions. Because yeah, if everybody uh, 
every user going home and then at six o'clock from the office and then they just plug in their EV uh, at the same time so we can imagine what happened to the, to the grid. To the grid yeah. Yes, and, and, and so on. I, I, I think the we will need to discuss that uh, in more detail uh, in other occasion. And I have a question for Ms. Minta. And in fact, my first experience in, in uh, I, I was a passenger, uh, I took taxi in from the uh, airport in, in Bangkok and in 2019, it was already EV. It was really a lifestyle changing experience. And I just would like to know, uh, Thailand as a forerunner of EV in ASEAN now, uh, does Thailand still have a uh, problem or issues or challenge uh, in, in deployment of EV? Uh, do, does Thailand have a plan or, st or, or specific strategy to drive the EV market in the country? Thank you, Ms. Minta. So it's, it's good that I hear that someone actually t took an EV taxi in Thailand. Um, first of all, yes, we do have um, energy efficiency national plans with transport sectors play a significant role in the national plans. Our energy efficiency plans in transport sectors include um, EV in all aspects, land, air, rail, and water. So with this EV plan in all four type, rail, air, water, land, we have three main pillars manufacturing industry sectors, the domestic usage and the infrastructure. For the industry side, we are promoting EVs and its power. This include the battery as well. To be one of the main EV manufacturing base in Asia, as well as setting standards for vehicles and the parts to be ready for the transition to the next generation's cleaner and better automotive. Uh, so the second pillar is promoting the use of electric vehicles by tax incentives and other measures to persuade that buyers, as I mentioned earlier and Dr. Indus mentioned before. And the last pillar is the infrastructure like developing charging stations, network that's adequate for the country. This is all on our um, policy plan. Also promoting smart grid technology that will connect and manage the system effectively as well. We have set our zero emission vehicle targets into two phases. The target is set for the zero emission vehicle. This is, this is open for future technology. We don't say it's AV target. We mention as the zero emission targets. To, so back to the two phases. The first phase is in eight years, ending in 2030. And the other phase is in 2035. We divide into targets two total targets, number of internal usage and the number of manufacturers. The targets are set for variety of, we should call like cars and pickup, motorcycle, three-wheeler, auto-tuk, bus and talks, boats, as well as train. For example, in 2030, as we and mentioned earlier by Dr. Pumpart, as um, saying mentioned earlier as well at 3030, the total cost and pickup manufactured in Thailand will be set EV, and in 2035 will increase the number to 50%. While we aim to push the trivialer tuk tuk to be 100% set EV for manufactured and newly registered usage by 2030. On the other hand, we look at a number of 50% newly registered car and pickup in 2030 and 35% for buses. So currently we are transforming our public buses in Bangkok to electric vehicle. We are looking at around two to 3,000 buses in Bangkok in short few times. So next time you arrive in Bangkok, Dr. Joko, there will be more EV, more public EV, like tuk-tuk and buses around in Bangkok. In these two years, we are preparing the infrastructure as mentioned earlier by Dr. Indra as well. The electricity network and linking data is very important with the um, EV platform and studying the tariff that will encourage the investor as well as no burden for the user. We also give incentives on taxes from, for import duties and custom tax. So this is a promise on 
the beginning of a transition to the next generations of cleaner and better automotive industry. And as mentioned, I totally agree with Dr. Inda for the challenges of balancing between the demand side and the supply side. When for the government, we know that the charging stations, it's not a lot, not enough. So we are trying to many ways with subsidies and other things where to put more fast charging stations around the country. We studied where to plot our fast charge first. We cannot put two, 3,000 stations at once, but with continuing, we're studying where to, where's the main point on the map that will persuade, will make the user buyer more, more safe of buying EV. So this is one of the challenge that we find. Also, um, I would say people in Thailand from my experience of a lot of few meetings, they still that believe that EV can be harder to use than the internal combustion engines car. Now, since they believe that for now in Thailand, we have a little floods um, from the raining seasons, they are scared that using EV car will make, while using the EV car will be easier than the internal combustion engine which I mentioned earlier, while passing the standards, will certify to the user of choosing the EV car rather than ICE car for the future new car that they're gonna buy. So here are the challenges that, that we need to overcome, that we need to work together with, in our own agencies and with private sectors to persuade buyers to use more EV as well as supporting the supply side on giving a better and cleaner technology of EV. Yes, Dr. Joko, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Minta. It is very interesting to know that EV is part of the more integrated plan of energy efficiency in transport and that uh, it is incredible that uh, Thailand has a very detailed plan, uh, yeah, disaggregated into the different modes. I have uh, another question, uh, one, one, one clarification question for Ms. Minta. What is the difference between carbon neutrality target 2050 and net zero target 2065? Just a, a short, short answer maybe? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, what is the difference between Thailand, Thai carbon neutrality target 2050 and net zero target 2065? So as the first our target is to be carbon neutral. So the balancing of it's it's not full RE yet. While it's further on, it's gonna be like no no fossil fuels and realize more on RE. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I have a question for uh, Mr. Sif. So uh, one of the thing that uh, I have. Uh, observe uh, in the developing countries such as in Southeast Asia is that uh, sometimes utilities are, are not eager to take a renewable or hybrid uh, electricity into the grid uh, because of oh, many things like uh, sometimes they need to compensate for the difference of the price and so on. Uh, what are the challenges that uh, you are facing in this field and what kind of uh, measures that the government should do yeah to to yeah to accelerate the the, the integration of this uh, renewable electricity into the into the grid thank you thank you dr joko actually this is the question <laughs> the, this is the problem so governments uh, let's say the regulatory bodies and governments in the many countries the lack of policies actually halts or let's say stops the further renewable developments in that particular country. I mean, uh, I could give a few examples like, uh, uh, for example, Thailand, has a very, Thailand had a very successful solar program, you know, until 2013. Uh, lot of, 
I would say that Thailand was one of the country in Asia who which led the solar PV development. You know, they had massive installations across the country. Then after 2013, there was some installations under small plants, like you know. And then after 2016, is basically Thailand only focused on the you know uh, rooftop plants uh, after 2016 probably. So that really after that the policy has not been you know very favorable towards the developer where they can develop and implement new plants so that that became a challenge for many many developers and they need to probably relocate their offices to other locations and uh, you know they waited too long probably right so likewise if we go to vietnam there are other challenges the local grid issues the renewable was let's say leading Probably Vietnam government didn't really expect so much renewable to come online, especially on the solar side and also on the wind suddenly. And suddenly there was a lot of curtailments on the solar plants in the daytime because it was an off-peak time and it was not really meeting. So local infrastructure of the transmission line was not really, let's say, ready for to take that uh, renewable power into the grid, right? And if we come to Indonesia, I mean, you know that uh, the government is really trying to push for the renewables, but not really much happening on the ground as, as a... So all, all this basically comes back to the policy and the regulatory framework, which, you know, governments in the region can really focus on and try to, uh, you can say, have a streamlined policy where developers are assured that, you know, they, they can build their long-term planning into the country and... Uh, you know, they can invest the money in the, into the projects. So I think that is one of the major, uh, I would say, the roadblock in, in penetration from the government side. And second, on the other side is the technology, right? The, the, the you, renewable has own challenge when it comes to the grid, which I was just explaining right before my presentation, right? It's not a conventional plant. It, it creates disturbance into the grid, right? So you, you need to have a technology which is, quite close to the, uh, you know, conventional plants. For, for example, combining wind, solar, and probably a battery, which can give you a capacity factor of uh, 50%, right? Which is much, much better than a individual solar plant, which give you a capacity factor of 18 or 20%. Right? So the, 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 the technological advancement need to come as well, which is, I think, somehow it's ready. It's, it may not be that affordable, to bring at least storage into the wind and solar because battery energy storage is still expensive. It only provides the storage for a very short durations. For long storage, I think we still need to rely upon the other, other type of storage form. So I think uh, the, the policy plus technological advance, advancement will help to penetrate the renewable energy, especially in the Asia. Of course, financing will be another, another challenge, but I think uh, that I think you have, you must have discussed uh, before this session a lot on the financing challenges. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sif. Maybe we can take one or two questions for 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 three minutes. Maybe from uh, utilities, electricity, to Cambodge, or uh, other stakeholder here. Any question? If there is no question then maybe i'll just get back to you uh, please uh, for each of the panelists i would like you to convey maybe your message in, in two or three sentences uh, what what the uh, uh, developing countries in in southeast asia should do yeah to accelerate both ev uh, renewable and as well as uh, as uh, battery technologies in in each of the countries so maybe i i give it first to to uh, Dr. Indra, and then to Ms. Minta, and to Mr. Sif, just to summarize uh, your, your, your key messages in two or three sentences. Please, uh, Dr. Indra. Thank you, Dr. Joko. So for, for me, uh, uh, electrification is uh, one of pathways, and we need really to embrace that uh, toward the energy efficiency and the future carbon neutrality. But again, uh, as I uh, explained in the presentation, we have three lenses that we need to really consider. We need to see from the life cycle and we need to see from the economic impact and finally the customer acceptance. If we can 
work together to cover all these three aspects uh, harmoniously, I think it will be a, a, a cleaner future towards uh, EV electrification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Indra. Uh, now, Ms. Minta. Yes, as the transport sectors use the highest energy consumption in Thailand to make a cleaner and better energy consumption, obviously, you need to start with the transport sectors. So, shifting to the EVs going to be a promising that we're going to have a cleaner and lower PM 2.5, obviously. The thing is, we need to work together on both supply side and the demand side, working together as as a whole, and then we can push the EV targets towards the target. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minta. And uh, Mr. Sif Agarwal? Sure. Basically, what I would, suggest, what I would say that uh, the a short, medium, and long-term policy framework from the governments will really help the developers to come and invest money and basically provide a sustainable uh, and the long term uh, renewable energy platform to the to the different countries i think that's a necessity which which is required along with you know other mechanisms for example other other infrastructure which which uh, electrical infrastructure need like transmission lines and you know other things so i think that would really help developers to come and invest and develop their assets in in the different countries Thank you, and I invite to give a big applause for the three panelists. Thank you so much.